brothers and sisters, this is my pleasure today to have a chance to sit and talk to you about the joys of being a union leader. In fact, we're supposed to be training you to become union leaders, and it's not that hard, but let me tell you who they are and how they get there. First, our predecessors, long before there was any union delegates or union activists or shop stewards or any of those sorts of folks, through other forms of leadership of the people, so to speak. One of the things that's been going on for a couple of thousand years is that the Catholic Church, for example, decided it would imitate the Roman system of authority. So it created uh, local parish priests who were like the local leaders. And then there was also monsignors and bishops and cardinals and such. And this particular organizational structure has continued successfully for 2,000 years. So there's something to recommend it that this sort of system can work. My own personal experience was I was very influenced by the priest who taught me how to be an altar boy, a Father Isaac. I'll tell you just briefly about Father Isaac. Local boy from the hybrid section of the Bronx who grew up, decided he would become a priest and give his life to the community. He did. Um, he was there for the weddings and he was also there in the case of some of the kids who went as far north as Sing Sing and were executed for various crimes they committed. So he would be with you whether things were good or whether things were as bad as they would ever get. But he'd always be there and he'd give himself to you. As a result, I, as a young man, and really pretty much the whole neighborhood, deeply admired him and would listen to him in many ways and be very respectful of him. In fact, I really wanted to be a priest when I was 10 years old. But what happened, of course, was I got to be 13 or 14 and met girls and I changed my mind. I couldn't become a priest. But there were other possibilities out there of the same sort. People who led others, but also did so while giving of themselves all the way. It's probably the most admirable thing you can think of. The next group I could tell you about would be local district captains of the Democratic and Republican Party. Those folks were individuals who lived in the area, and if you want to know what they owed to the, their constituents, well, we have a book for you that we'll be giving you called Plunkett of Tammany Hall, which is a pretty good explanation of how George Washington Plunkett did his work over the course of his entire lifetime, working within the Democratic Party, but essentially working within his community to keep his community in great shape. If you had somebody in your family die, he would be showing up there with free food for the, you know, the funeral or for the wake, stuff like that. He would also, if you had any trouble, for example, with the police where your kids were arrested, he'd go to the police precinct and show up. And of course, everybody knew that he was a prominent person. And the fact that he was there with you meant your son might get better treatment from the police because he was there on their behalf. In short, he gave of himself all the time, day in and day out. Good. That's exactly what makes for a wonderful union delegate. In our particular situation, we're here in the organization of staff analysts, but Let's go back a bit further. Where do we all come from? Well, we have some books we'll be giving you about the early history of unions, but let me be more specific. The first union that came into existence that was somewhat similar to us in New York City, and of which we are a lineal descendant, was a group that no longer exists anymore called the United Public Workers. They represented everybody who went to work for welfare in the 1930s. They were highly progressive, white collar union, very, very uh, militant, and they had a number of firsts. They were the first union around, I think. There was both males and females and elected a female president. They were also the first one, I think, to ever elect a black female president. So they, they were really quite far ahead of their time back in the 1930s and 40s. Unfortunately for them, when the McCarthy period came along, they were very true to their principles. And when they were told to surrender the lists of all their members so the McCarthy people could go after them, they refused. That, of course, was contempt of Congress. And the president of the UPW went to jail for it. And the union itself was broken up and persecuted out of existence within the welfare department. I spoke to one of the members of the UPW when I first came on the job in 1965. She had come on in the 1930s. 
and she told the story of how during the 1950s, if you joined the welfare department, as soon as you joined, they'd tell you that you had to spy upon your co-workers and find out what they were doing in the evenings and find out if they talked to you about politics or anything. And if you refused, they'd transfer you to Staten Island in case you lived in the Bronx. Or if you lived in Staten Island, they'd transfer you to the Bronx. This did not stop the people in the welfare department from wishing a little bit better life than they were being handed without a union. So they went ahead and formed a new union, which became AFS CME Local 371. This one, however, although it was better than no union, wasn't militant enough for the people who were coming into the welfare department by the 1960s. So they went ahead and split off and created the Social Service Employees Union, of which in 1965, I became a proud member. So here we had three unions in a row, here I'm joining the third one. Well, SSE was a very militant union, and I took great pride in belonging to it, and they had very dramatic effects upon labor relations for the whole city, but that's another story. I won't go into that right this moment. Just tell you that I did love the group, and I was very proud one day in 1974, when having been a union delegate for that organization for a long time, and having been involved with a lot of activities, they were kind enough to decide they wanted me to come to work for them as a union organizer. Now, I do have a lot of stories to tell you about my time as a delegate, and quite a few stories I'd like to tell you at some point about my time as a organizer for the Social Service Employees Union. But since we're sitting here in the organizational staff analyst headquarters, I probably should move along to get the history together first. In 1978, the Organizational Staff Analyst did exist. It was a voluntary organization, it wasn't yet a union, and it wasn't connected to the Social Service Employees Union whatsoever. It had been around since it had been named the Committee for Personnel Examiners. And as you know, if you read the material we've handed out, it actually was around since 1957 in one form or another. But by 1978, there were hundreds of analysts, which was the new title that had been broadbanded into existence. And they had begun to put people into this title series, who in fact had previously been unionized people. The way they would do it is, they would put out a flyer, recruiting for a new job. They'd say, if you want to write procedures for the welfare department, Put your name in, but you were required to be either a Supervisor 1 Welfare or a Staff Analyst. Well, the Supervisors 1 Welfare came off of a civil service list, so you didn't get a chance to pick your friend or your relative, just whoever happened to be on the list who was available. On the other hand, there had been no test for Staff Analysts at that point, so the issue was they would like to quite often pick their friends and relatives, so they'd pick a friend and make them a Staff Analyst. This meant, of course, there were less jobs available for supervisors one welfare. But the way the analyst job title had been written back in 1975, it was so broadly defined that you could use that job for super one welfare or staff analyst, but you could also turn around and say, for a different job, you needed either an accountant or a staff analyst, an engineer or a staff analyst, Actually, you could pick almost any professional civil service title and say, or a staff analyst. What was going on under Ed Koch was, it was much like civil service, so they were hiring hundreds and then thousands of people to be analysts. This was interfering with the union's representation because people were being taken out of their jobs and given this analyst job. Others who were busy doing the right thing, staying on location, doing their work, were having their promotional opportunities taken away from them by this new title. So the unions felt they had to do something about it. At this time, the Organization of Staff Analysts, which was not a union, went around and spoke to different groups about who would help them get unionized. And they spoke to 371, and they spoke to DC 37, and they spoke to 237 Teamsters. And it turns out 237 Teamsters gave them the best offer because 237 Teamsters said they would keep them all in one group, whereas Victor Gopam said, well, I'll spread you out among all the locals. And 371 said, well, we'll based it upon agency chapter, which spread you out in different agencies. 
They didn't want to be spread out. They wanted to be concentrated in one grouping, and the Teamsters promised them that. So they went with the Teamsters. I, meanwhile, was back there in 371 as an organizer, and we really had decided within SSEU that this was a title series that should be unionized. And the one reason why we would be the one that would fight to make it happen was because, I already mentioned to you, SSEU was very militant. And I had been pretty active myself. We had lots of other pretty active people around, which makes for a wonderful organizational team because, because it does. So we said in 1978, maybe we'll do it. Whether or not OSA chooses us, we'll go ahead and try to win the hearts and minds of all the analysts and see what happens. As part and parcel of this, when the first exams came along for staff and associate staff analysts, we filed for them. We not only filed for them, we talked to other people into filing for them. We sent word out to all the different locations of the Social Service Employees Union that there was this new title called Analyst, and there was a test coming along. And if you didn't know what an analyst was, don't worry about it. They paid pretty well, and if you passed the test, well, you'd be an analyst. So go ahead and file for the exam, because you had to write the experience paper first. So we helped them write the experience papers because we had figured out how to do that. You see, the strange thing is, under Koch, the Department of Personnel would put out a qualifying experience paper that you had to do before you could take the test. And the experience paper required you to say that you were whatever the test was, in this case, an analyst, before you took a test to become an analyst. Well, that's slightly insane, but once you know those are the rules, it becomes a really easy thing to get around because you just sit there and define the work that you've been doing all these other years as analytical work. And since the English language is what it is, you won't be telling any lies either because, in fact, we all do what analysis is supposed to do. We all break down into component parts complex matters for greater understanding. So, in short, darn near anybody could qualify as having said they had done work, whatever the title was, analytically. So we trained our folks to do that. And then we actually reached out to the organizational staff analyst, which was in existence and was giving a training course preparing you for the exam. And we asked them if we could, you know, pay a fee, join up and, and, and be given a chance to take the test. And they said, no. No, why not? Well, because you see, most of our people are provisional in place. And um, we don't want them risking their job about somebody else coming along and getting a better uh, score on the exam. I said, well, I think you're being short-sighted, and I will change that someday, but okay, I understand for today. At that point, Tom Anderson, who later on became the vice president of OSA, who was then an organizer for 371, turned around and set up training classes, so we gave training classes. And over 200 people took the classes. And a very large number of the people took all these tests, passed them, and became permanent civil service analysts eventually. But first, there was a small problem along the way because, again, this is the period of Ed Koch, and they didn't really want to obey the law or the rules when it came to civil service exams. So myself and Tom would go down to the hiring pools once they were being called, and we'd go inside at first because we both had passed, so we, could, we were allowed to go inside looking for a job and finding out what was going on. And what was going on was the people already appointed provisionally were being appointed, and those who were not already appointed provisionally weren't being offered a job at all. They're being asked to come back to pool after pool and never being offered a job. That's clearly a violation of the intent of the civil service law, but what do you do about it? Well, what we did about it was based upon our knowledge from earlier times with SSEU, we formed a committee to, to move the list. Very specifically, when we had been going down to the hiring pools, we had asked people, we stood at a table outside the hiring pool, and we asked people to sign in before they went in. And actually, I suppose you could even say we were being a little dishonest there because we were both wearing suits. And here you are looking for a job, and you walk down a street, and you're going to a particular building to go in for a job, and here's these men in suits standing outside with a table saying, all analysts must stop here first. All candidates for analysts stop here. They all stopped. And we got their name and a home address and telephone number. Didn't have much to wear cell phones in those days. And we had a, a list we could contact. So I called some of them up one night and found one who had a background in the accountants union 
and understood what a committee with list was, and he came in, Arnie Kingston, and he made some more phone calls to other people who were on the list, and then we had a meeting on a Saturday, and I sat down and said, listen, what they're doing to you right now, calling you in, pool after pool, but never hiring you, really is against the civil service law. They're trying to preserve all the jobs that people have already appointed, and what's the point of taking a test in a case like that? The way you correct this is with a committee to move the list, which turns around and fights to get you your job. There was enough people in the room who were capable people, especially one guy, a guy named Michael C. Jen, who had been a former commissioner of public works in the city of Binghamton, that they understood what I was saying was correct, and they would have to fight for themselves, although we would help them. We'd give them paper, uh, photocopy machine usage, uh, telephones, uh, coffee and cake, uh, legal help in terms of uh, law books or even consultation with lawyers, but they would have to be the ones making the big stink about the fact that the law was being disobeyed. Well, they did all that, and we got better at it real fast because well, the analysts are a pretty smart bunch. And so we figured out when they had their next hiring pool and people walk inside, there's going to be somebody there from the community with a list. In fact, there's going to be about 20 people trained by us, all wearing little American flag buttons in their lapel. And as people walked in, they'd be given information ahead of time by us saying, if you're looking to get a job and you're having trouble getting a job, see one of the representatives of the committee to move the list who's wearing an American flag pin in his or her lapel. They did. They'd walk up to one and say, look, I'm trying to get a job. I can't, I've been to five places. No one wants to hire me. Okay, wait. Wait till I get two more. When three had been accumulated, they'd be marched over to the table for hiring. They'd sit down. And the hiring person would do through a formality of an interview and say, well, this job is not for you. Um, you should try someplace else. At which point, the member of the committee with the list would come over and say, hold on, you didn't sign the card turning this person down. Now, the rules said if they turned three people in a row down, they had to leave the hiring pool. They couldn't hang around for a friend to show up. So they would kind of resist signing the card. They'd make up all kinds of, I don't want to hurt the person's chances. No, sign the card. If you turn the person down, the, law, the rules say you have to sign the card. In most cases, they would sign the card at that point. Once in a while, they wouldn't, in which case, the member of the committee with the list would all of a sudden turn around and yell to the personnel person running the pool, some clerical person, Miss, Miss, the representative from such and such an agency is refusing to sign a candidate's card, although he turned the first candidate down. That's not the way it's supposed to be, is it? At which point the person would either sign the card or, recognizing the feet, get up and leave. One or the other. Most commonly, they actually began to hire people because if you had three in a row come and you didn't hire somebody and you had signed a card, the result finally was at the end of a single day, we had gotten 50 people hired who had never been hired before. They'd been called to pool after pool after pool, never offered a job. And now all of a sudden they were being hired. Of them, 47 signed a card for SSEU that they wanted to belong to a union because they had just had taught to them the value of unified action of intelligent people trying to stop the city from misusing the law, misusing the rules, and just, you know, being unfair. So that would be one of the first victories we had. And it was not unusual because we kept doing the same thing over and over again and kept on getting more people appointed on this basis. And then years later, we did the same thing with the associate list as well when it came out. So this was getting us a certain amount of support. And we were in the meantime, while we were trying to win the hearts and minds of the people and having pretty good success there, we then ran to the fact that we couldn't get an election because Ed Koch was dedicated to the fact that analysts would never be unionized. So we were having endless hearings at the Office of Collective Bargaining, but we never got any large number of people who had a chance to get into the union. And this went on for years. The result was all the unions gave up. The Social Service Employees Union pretty much was on its way out of the game by 1982 and gave up completely by 83 along with DC 37. The Teamsters also gave up. I mean, it was a five-year effort and not one bit of dues was coming in and they couldn't imagine there was any point in going on. They, they thought they couldn't win. 
I didn't agree. Uh, and what's more, I had along the way become an analyst because I took the test. You know, once we were getting involved with the campaign, I figured, okay, take the test. So I took the test and I had become an analyst. So I was now an associate staff analyst working in the Human Resources Administration. And somehow, when all the unions gave up fighting, I was supposed to accept the fact that I was either managerial or confidential and then couldn't belong to a union. Well, here's a problem. I wasn't managerial and I certainly wasn't confidential because I wouldn't have kept any of the secrets no matter what was. You know, ask me anything, I'll tell you right now. I don't mind. So I was being asked to go along with a lie. And I didn't think that was reasonable. Neither did most of the other analysts whose hearts and minds had been won by this joint effort over the course of the previous five years. In short, we had become a force, an unofficial force, not a legal force, but we had become a force anyway just because we were mutually supporting. Around the time of the Teamsters giving up on this and the other unions giving up on this, there was a coming together of the people who had been supporting the Teamsters before that, the ones who had been supporting 371 before that, or supporting the District Council, or supporting all, the, all these groups coalesced into a fairly strong force of perhaps 600 of us out of the 3,000 analysts who were just dedicated to the fact that we don't care what anyone else says. We know we're neither managerial nor confidential. We know they're cheating on the rules, and we know we have a right to this, so we're just going to keep on going until finally the world agrees with us. And we did that. And we did that for quite a while, but we actually had a little bit of success fairly early on. In 1985, while Ed Koch was still preventing the Office of Collective Bargaining from ever finding analysts to be unionizable, the Public Employee Relations Board, which had been examining the matter over at the Board of Education, finally came to the conclusion that there was a very tiny number of analysts who were union eligible and would they like to vote for a union. Fantastic. So, in the spring, of 1985, the organization of staff analysts competed with the last remaining local that was paying any attention to the analysts at all, which was 1180 of CWA, and we got involved in a campaign. But keep in mind what I told you before about how we had become together, how we had become something real, even if we weren't official. We had so much help in that campaign from volunteers, it was astonishing. Bernard Yen was very grateful because we had helped him when he had a problem. Again, unofficially, but we had helped him. He wrote a letter to each one of the 38 voters, three pages long in perfect penmanship, plus telling them, if you have any question, please call me. We had a lot of campaigning of that sort, very sincere stuff. And the result was finally the vote came in 20 for OSA, seven for no union, and nobody for the opposing union, CWA. So we had really demonstrated that we had a right to become unionized and that OSA was the place we probably would become unionized. Only because we had been fighting for seven years already and people recognized that. We then sent Joan Keok, our attorney, up to Albany. She explained to the Public Employee Relations Board the deals had been done between the Office of Collective Bargaining and all the different unions to get them to stop fighting for the analysts. And Perp said, well, that's wrong. You can't do that. So the next thing I knew, they weren't talking to the other unions. They were talking to us. The other unions weren't going to contest with us for an election because they knew we'd win. So we ended up having 650 people allowed to be unionized. However, it should be noticed that even there, the Koch administration cheated they agreed to 650, which was the minimum we would accept, because that's how many members we had. But then they determined that 301 of those people who had signed cards, who thought they were union members, who didn't think they were managerial, didn't think they were confidential, well, they were all wrong. They were actually managerial or confidential, although they didn't know it. So they wouldn't let them vote. They gave us 301 who didn't want to belong to OSA. But then we had a 30-day campaign period, and we wrote letters, and we made phone calls, and most of the 301 voted for us, along with all the ones who had wanted to belong in the first place. So we won three to one over the no union vote, and OSA became 650 strong. We continued to campaign further. We now had to set up two separate organizations. Those who were unionized already were in what we now called OSA. 
those who were not yet unionized were put into a group called the Organization of Staff Analysts Related Titles, which really was OSA, except it wasn't exactly the same organization, but it had almost the same constitution. It's just people who weren't yet unionized could belong to that one because the Taylor Law says you can't have unionized employees and managers in the same unit. And since the city kept insisting people who weren't really managers were managers to avoid the possibility of somebody saying we're doing the wrong thing, we had two separate groups. To begin with, there were 650 analysts unionized in OSA. But then, what happened to the 301 who wanted to be in but weren't allowed to be in the election? Ah, they became members of OSART. Over the next two years, the city cheated and cheated and cheated. Every time somebody left the union for one reason or another, we tried to get a replacement, they wouldn't give us somebody who wanted to be in. They'd only give us somebody who didn't want to be in. They go their way to find people who didn't want to be in the union and say, oh, you can have that person, but you can't have somebody you want. How far did they go on this? How silly? My favorite story is that of Flora Jones. Flora Jones was one of the founding members of OSA. She had become unionized. She worked on the eighth floor of 60 Hudson Street, downtown New York. She transferred within the same branch of the agency, Family and Ill Services of the Human Resource Administration, eighth floor, to the uh, tenth floor, to Family and Ill Services of the Human Resource Administration on the eighth floor. She had been on the tenth, she went to the eighth. Now, in her new post, she was working for Sheila Gorski, who was an officer of the organization of staff analysts. All of a sudden, HRA Labor Relations said, but you can't have her in the union because she's confidential in her new post. Well, isn't that absurd? Her boss is a union officer, but she's confidential? That's nonsense. But if you went to a hearing, it would take you forever and a half to get the decision. But they kept on offering you, they would give you people that you didn't want or didn't, they, they didn't want to be in the union instead of Flora Jones. So we shrunk. I mean, the union part shrunk. We shrunk from 650 down to 450 because we wouldn't take the ones who didn't want to be in. But we grew in OSART and kept on growing. And by the time Ed Koch, thank God, finally left the city of New York, no longer a mayor, and a new mayor came in, I got to meet a new Office of Labor Relations director named Eric Schmertz. And Eric was really a welcome arrival because he was honest and courageous and would do the right thing. Which is why 11 years earlier, Koch had fired him. But now he was back and trying to straighten out the mess that Koch had made of the law. At least to whatever extent he could touch it. And we were one of the years he could touch it. So when I first met him, he said, young man, it's a long time ago, young man, do you know that over the past seven years, everything that's been done to your title series has been illegal? And I responded, yeah, I know that, but I'm really glad to hear you say it. He said, but I don't know what to do about it. I said, I do. What? I then explained to him, just like I did a minute ago to you, about OSA and OSART. And I told him, OSA has gone from 650 down to 450, but OSART has grown from 301 to 1,000. And every one of those people has signed a card for a union that has a, con for a organization that has a constitution saying you're supposed to go to the union and they're paying dues. So that's like the equivalent of a union designation card. If you will have your staff at the Office of Labor Relations look at these individuals and what they really do for a living, you're going to find out none of them are managerial or confidential. None of them. Well, he thought that was a fair offer on my part, so he sent his people to spend what took out to be a whole year looking at every one of the thousand people what they did for a living. At the end of the year, we went from 450 to 1,450 on one day because none of them turned out to be ineligible for unionization in spite of all the stories that have been told for the years before. On that day, Director Schmertz complimented me, said, well, you did it. You were right. Now, I don't know what to do now, but, but you were right. I said, well, actually, I do know what to do. He said, what? I said, well, it's been a whole year since you gave me the right to give you the OSART cards that we looked at. He said, yeah. I said, I've been recruiting. More people have joined. The people who have already joined get other people to join. We're growing. He said, how many more cards have you got? I said, 850. 
Oh my God, he said, now you got more than half the title series. Okay, let's change the rules. From now on, we will ask the agencies to come down and fight for whoever they think is really managerial, or really confidential, not make believe, but really. And they have to make their arguments too. Well, that can lead to a really long series of stories also because that was an interesting period. I guess I'll just stop for a second with two of them. One time, we had been told that we could not have anybody in the office, the, mayor, the police department's office of management, analysis, and planning. And the reason why we were told we couldn't have anyone was because Helen Tanzash, who was the head of personnel, didn't like the idea of civilians uh, being in a union. And she alleged that whatever was going on in the police department's analysis and planning unit was in fact secret and you couldn't give it out that information. Well, in terms of the Taylor Law, that's nonsense because it's not secret in a labor relations ca uh, category. It's just, you know, in fact, come to think of it, it's complete nonsense because nothing they do there is secret. But even if it was, sitting alongside my staff analysts in OMAP are unionized police lieutenants. Sitting, aside my, sitting right next to my associate staff analysts in OMAP are police captains who also belong to a union, so why our guys couldn't belong to a union made no sense. But a compromise in order to get past the opposition of Ms. Tanzjes, who was very close to the commissioner, was a good idea. So I gave him a compromise. I said, look, let me have into the union only those who've already signed cards and made it clear they're not going to be confidential, they're not going to be loyal to confidentiality. Let me just have the ones who are already in the union, or in the signed cards already, and anybody new coming in, you can keep confidential. Worked out really well. Everybody in OMAP from the analyst title had signed a card, so we got them all. And within a couple of years, Helen Tanjas wasn't there anymore, and no one else remembered what I had said about you could keep the others. So from that day to this, we've kept every single analyst in OMAP into the union. Second one would be the story of what happened with the Office of Labor Relations and uh, of HRA. They came with a list of 25 people who were managerial and confidential. And we sat there and it was a gal named Gloria Demopoulos who was representing them. I said, well, okay, Gloria, let's take that first name. What dirty little secrets does this person have that the city can't afford the union knowing? And her response was quite strange, but then this whole process was strange. Her response was, Bob Krogan, I couldn't eat dinner at my mother's house for Thanksgiving because of you, which kind of surprised me because I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, tell me. She said, my mother spent the whole dinner yelling at me because if I didn't let my sister get unionized, she could lose her job. And it's your fault she said that. I said, look, Gloria, the truth is we have a no layoff agreement with the city right now. And if she'd been a provisional now for more than two years, if she's in the union, they can't lay her off. But we've had a change of mayoral administration and new bosses. Truthfully, you may have helped to get that job in the first place provisionally, but you can't keep her there if somebody comes along and says they don't want her there. I can keep her there. I can make sure she gets due process and is treated fairly. This caused the person running the little session there, Jane Rota, to decide it was time to break for lunch. The emotions were very high. And after lunch, we came back, and I was looking for Gloria and her team, and Jane told me, Gloria called up from lunch saying she wasn't coming back. You can have the whole 25. So that's kind of like how this game played out, very strangely. But at the end of that, we were up to, well, 3,500 people rather than 1,450, so we had really gotten to the point where we had all the staffs and associates. And then we had to decide whether we were going to stop there or not, and we decided we wouldn't stop there. We would go after the people we left behind in the Health and the Hospitals Corporation. And we attempted to engage with DC-37, which had dropped out of the game back in 1983, but by this time they were getting a little bit, <laughs> we were very noticeable, we were big, we were over 3,000 people, not unionized. They kind of like wanted us to affiliate. So I made an offer. I said, yeah, we'll think about affiliating if you will agree that you'll go back to organizing. And tentatively, they thought that would be a pretty good idea. So we moved pretty quickly and jointly organized in the hospital corporation. And instead of taking 
7 to 14 years to do something, it went much faster. Now every year we're picking up new people. We weren't the only ones. The first group we picked up were the systems analysts. Some went to OSA, which had done most of the work. Some also went to 2627, the computer local, and others went to 1407, the accountant's local, depending upon their function. Then, when we got to the healthcare program and planning analysts, we allowed the city, or the health, HHC, to keep the highest, uh, keep one group of them, and we picked up the um, uh, supervisor, no, the senior healthcare program planning analysts. Uh, CWA got the program planning analysts, and uh, 768, the health services local of DC 37, got the assistant healthcare program planning analysts. These are little details. Time was passing. We were doing pretty good. So we reached out now to the Transit Authority and the Manhattan and Bronx Service Transit Operating Authority which actually is where my father had been a member of his union. So I was kind of anxious to make sure the analysts there had a chance to be unionized too. And then our deal with 37 came to a head. This was going to be a real organizational drive. We had the organizers, we had the volunteer analysts who had, in many cases, now retired from the job as union members and had come for just get paid their expenses and they'd come and work for us because they believed in what they were doing. I mean, this is the level of drive that had been achieved over a period of years. Well, since we had the organizers, they could help out by giving us their um, print shop and uh, maybe a few other things they could do for us. But mostly we try to train their organizers to get them back into the whole game of organizing. And the president of the local that would have been worked with was a guy named Lou Albano. He thought that was a great idea. It was proposed to Stanley Hill. He thought it was a great idea. And so we were on our way going forward and I was already to seriously discuss affiliation with DC 37 as soon as we were victorious in TA and MAPSTOA. I went everything went wrong. Everything went wrong because DC 37 got involved with all kinds of things that came out. Uh, Stanley, my friend, uh, had not done as good a job as one would have hoped in terms of keeping control of the ones working for him and various illegal actions had been committed, including, horribly enough, vote fraud on a contract decision. This led to 28 indictments. This led to large numbers of leadership being either asked to leave or put in jail. And Stanley himself was asked to step down by AFSCME, and trustees were brought in. It killed the organizing drive. They, they did no help at all. We were going after staff and associates. They're supposed to be going after assistant transit management and the associate transit management analysts. They didn't do it at all. And we weren't allowed to because we had already agreed to let them do that. In fact, it was so extreme a problem that we even lost by a couple of votes, but we lost the MAPSTOA vote. We won the Transit Authority, they voted for us. But the people over at MAPSTOA are watching all this dreadful news hit the newspapers every day about DC 37 and corruption and this and that. They didn't think too well unions at that moment, so by a tiny percentage, like 52%, we lost. The only time we ever lost a vote like that, but we lost that one. That didn't mean we forgot about it. And we're back there right now trying to win it this time. But the reality is we did lose one. And then we went back and started going after still other groups. And we've been going after other groups ever since. One of the things that's kind of funny is the game that gets played at the Health and Hospitals Corporation. When we had done the original deal wherein we picked up systems analysts, assistant systems and senior systems analysts, we had left behind for a three-year period people we thought were neither managerial nor confidential, but the HAC was assisting they were, so we gave them three years to clean up their act and give them really managerial duties to do, or confidential work to do. Then three years later, we came back to get the ones that weren't being given managerial duties or confidential duties, which turns out to be all of them when we had the hearings. So now we're into an election over there. And it turns out in this case, it's a contested election because the deal I had with 37 fell apart when the trustees came in, and all of a sudden now they're going to compete with us. It, it didn't do them any good. They didn't win, but they did compete with us. They came in and put organizers in and stuff like that. 
But we'd already been out there for a long time, talking to people and getting to know them and having them get to know us. And I go out to a location, Morrisania Health Clinic, out in uh, River Avenue, up on 167th Street. And a guy walks in to one of those diners that you go around recruiting people at and buying them lunch and says, Bob, you don't owe me lunch, I owe you lunch. So that sounds good, but why? He said, look, I used to be a senior systems analyst, but you came along and you unionized them. So as that was going on, management came to me and said, listen, we're willing to promote you now to supervising systems analyst. I said, but let's go take me out of the union. They said, that's all right. That's what we want. We're going to give you $5,000 more if you agree to become a supervising systems analyst. I said, well, $5,000, I wouldn't have turned down either. But what change in duties did you have? He said, that's the best part. None at all. I did the same job, but now I got more money, thanks to you. So I owe you. I said, well, that's a great story. I guess you're going to vote for me this time. He said, no, I, I will vote for you, but it won't make a difference. I won't be in your union anyway. I said, what? He said, yeah. This week, they came and told me they're making me a senior management consultant. I said, wait a minute. What is a senior management consultant? He says, I don't know. I said, have your job, has your job changed? No. Are you getting paid by a HHT paycheck? Yeah. Are there any junior management consultants or management consultants? No. I said, for God's sake, they just made up the name. It's the same job you had before, but now calling it by a different name. He said, yeah, but I'm getting $5,000 more. Every time you show up, I get more money. I love this. This is great. Well, it was great because he led me to know that the next group I had to file for, after I won, the supervising systems analyst was, that's right, senior management consultant. And a number of years later, we represent senior management consultants. Then what do they do? They turn around and create another title called Senior Consultant Management Information Services. They're getting lazy. They're not making up new words. They're just moving the words around. We went after that title and won that title too. It, it goes on and on. They're constantly doing this and we're constantly doing what we do. All of this is the history of how OSA came into existence almost by accident. But it turned out to be a very, very fortuitous accident, not just because you became a member of a union, but also because we did something for the whole labor movement. We stopped them from undercutting the labor movement because we keep on pointing out that they call people managerial or confidential who aren't. Because we keep winning these fights every time. We win them in front of the Office of Collective Bargaining or the Public Employee Relations Board legally. And then we win them with the hearts and minds by winning the votes. So having shown this example forever and ever and ever, we're actually getting imitated these days, not as much as I'd like, but we're still getting imitated. Now, we have CWA, which is actually one of the first ones out of the box, doing more organizing than they used to. But we also have DC 37, Local 375, picked up 10 administrative level one titles. It was a shocking thing when we got the first admin ones. They had kept on telling us, these are really managerials. Well, no, they weren't. They weren't at all, not in terms of their job duties. No, they weren't confidential either. And what's more, they voted for us because they liked us. Same thing is now going on for many more titles that 37 has filed for. After 375 won their 10, they went after still more, 37 did. So we're having a pretty good impact upon convincing the rest of the world that you should keep on fighting to unionize people. And actually, mostly, you should fight on keeping the government to tell the truth, whether it wants to or not. If a person is not managerial and not confidential, then they shouldn't be saying they are because it's a damn lie and you shouldn't be lying to people. The government certainly shouldn't be. So we've done very well with our history of getting ourselves into existence. Just a few things along the way which have been going on. We, as you know, we're willing to affiliate with DC 37. If 37 had uh, uh, not fallen to disrepair at the time of the big scandals in 98, 99, uh, we've never stopped investigating the possibility of affiliation. We are, uh, in our own way, a very valuable bridesmaid. We haven't married anyone yet, but we, we continue to be getting stronger all the time. We've never had a year. I don't think we've ever had two, a year in a row where we shrunk. We've always grown. But the main thing is, are we doing a really good job for our members? And that's where you come in. Because all the things I'm talking about here is ancient history. 
that went down over the past years from 1978 until today, or maybe even a little before 1978. But where do you come in? Well, you're part of that group that enabled this to happen. You're the people who are interested enough to pay attention to the union and to want to be involved. And in order to help you do that, we're giving this class, not just on the history of OSA, which I've kind of like gone over lightly once, and mind you, I'll stick around for questions because there's a lot more in case you want to ask any questions about this or that. But now I'd like to swing into the second portion, which is, so what's a union delegate? What am I asking to be? What's this all about? Well, it really it comes down to like that district captain or that local parish priest or rabbi or minister or imam, you know, somebody who's on the location, who cares about their fellow workers. There's no money involved. You're not going to get paid by us to do this. There is honor, a lot of honor involved. In fact, truthfully, if you go to work for the union, there's no money involved either because we don't get any extra money for working here. But there is honor. And there is a feeling of job satisfaction and a really strong feeling of worthwhile battles that we can fight. How worthwhile? I'll give you an idea how worthwhile. In 1988 approximately, or 87, we were on our way to having the first 650 in the city agencies unionized. At that time, 300 of them were provisional employees, pure provisionals. It was that Koch period. They had a lot of provisionals. Of those 300, 12 called me during the course of the year to tell me they were being fired. 12 individual cases of firing. But since we were not yet a union, there was no due process. I couldn't bring it to a trial. I couldn't ask for witnesses. I couldn't say they did something wrong. I just had to listen to the story and see what I could do extra legally. I could do something because in three cases out of the 12, we were able to save the person either by getting somebody else to pick them up or having somebody else walk over and talk to the boss and calm them down. Whatever that we did, we saved three out of the 12 and lost nine. And what kind of things had those nine done to get fired? Well, remember, there's no trial here, no witnesses. So all I have is what the people tell me. And what they told me, well, in one case, the gal says, listen, the boss was very clear. He came over and told me he needed a line for his cousin. He needed to give a job to his cousin, so I was being fired. He told me right out. Now, I don't think there's a single taxpayer anywhere in the whole city of New York would have approved of that. But do I believe her? Well, yeah, I do believe her. Then there was the next guy. I'm sorry, are you stopping? No. Then there was the next guy who told me about the fact that he had had five outstanding evaluations from five different bosses over a period of about 10 years. This guy must have been a pretty good worker because I never got five outstanding evaluations from five different bosses over a 10-year period. But the sixth boss, well, she didn't like him. Well, he didn't like her either. They didn't like each other. And once she felt secure after he'd been on the job for six months, she fired him, not because he did something wrong. She never said anything wrong. She just didn't like him. And when you were provisional and no union coverage, it's a hire at will, fire at will job. And she could do that. And she did that. The third one, I remember, was Gallium Kathy Burrs and a friend of mine, she was recruited away from a pretty good provisional position with HRA to a better provisional position, paying more money at another agency because the boss had a special project he needed to accomplish. He had promised the commissioner he could get it done. He needed Kathy to help him. A year later, he couldn't get it done. He just wasn't able to. And he needed a scapegoat of someone who had failed other than him. So he explained it to her. Listen. You have six months of accumulated comp time because we've been working so much overtime over the past year to get this job done, but it's not working. If you'll agree to sign a letter of resignation, I'll let you work out. I'll let you work out the next six months of comp time. So you won't lose money. Otherwise, I'll just fire you. In which case, you lose the comp time. She took the offer. So those are the kinds of stories why people were being fired. But maybe they were making it up. Maybe this is not what was going on, right? Well, I should have a double check here. The next year, we were unionized. We had a contract. We had grievance rights. We had due process, disciplinary rights. You could still fire anyone and do something wrong, but they had to do something wrong. You had to have evidence. You had to have warned and cautioned. You had to have the normal procedures you think are fair. So I sat back that year waiting for the onslaught of 
disciplinary cases I would fight. Was it 12? Well, no. Was it 10? No. 5? No. 1. There was one case in the next 12 months, not 12, one. And that one we won easily because the guy didn't have good evidence at all. My God, I cannot quantify. You're an analyst, I'm an analyst. I cannot quantify. How valuable is this union for the members? Versus being provisional, you could get fired at the rate of 4% in the course of a single year, and if you had a 25-year career, you'd come close to 100% chance of running into the wrong person and losing your job for no good reason. With the union, until such time as you do something wrong or you don't perform well or you're absolutely falling apart, your job is yours until such time as you choose to go away. How valuable is that? Because that's how valuable the union is for you. And that's how valuable we make it by our existence. It's a group effort. And we're calling upon you guys to do the on-location part. Now, when I talk about doing the on-location part, the local district captain, the local parish priest, the local imam, the local rabbi. What I'm talking about is you becoming very important to the people there. And the way you do that is you give of yourself. Remember Father Isaac? That guy used to fall asleep on the altar because he'd be out all night long with someone who was dying. He really gave himself. That's the ideal delegate. That's the one who's going to be admired. That's the one that management's going to admire and the workers are going to admire. What kind of things do you have to know? Well, we're giving a whole long training class on things like the contract, negotiations, grievances, disciplinaries. But I'll go back further and just tell you that what's really necessary here is for you to have this first-person relationship with all these people, that they can all trust you, that they all know that you're reliable and straight, not self-seeking, not looking for yourself, but looking for them. And if you achieve that, well, then you end up having, this is very interesting because it's true, you end up having enormous amounts of power on the job. Oh, I ain't kidding enormous amounts of power on the job given to you by everybody else because of your behavior, because of the fact you're acting so properly, so helpfully, so reliably. I suppose at this point I should stop and give you some examples. I, mean, I once got sent by SSU Local 371 down to uh, Washington, D.C., to their AFL-CIO training college for organizers. And there I met a guy named Harry Millstone, who started organizing back in the year 1935. And had just retired, but we came back to teach us. He taught a whole room full of union organizers. And what he mostly did was, he gave him some exercises to do, we did some practices together, but what he mostly did was he told anecdotes of his own stories and history so we would learn from those. And we did. So I'll give you a few anecdotes and, you know, some idea of how it works. Let's take, first of all, the Great Green Chair Lottery. The Great Green Chair Lottery had to do with the fact that at one point, the Welfare Department had reorganized, and as a result, there was no longer the same number of people required to have swivel chairs. Now, before that, they had provided it every worker with a non-swivel chair with no wheels at the bottom. But the supervisors and the clericals at the end of the row would be getting swivel chairs. Once the reorganization went down, population had changed. There were some 33 green swivel chairs stored in the basement. Every once in a while, somebody would go downstairs and see a nice swivel chair and bring it upstairs and put it at their desk. Plant management would see what they had done, get all upset, bring it back downstairs and disputes were breaking out. Well, it made no sense. You had the property there, why shouldn't it be used? But who gets to use it? Right, the union had a lottery where everybody who wanted a swivel chair got to put their name in and with big furor on lunchtime one day we had the drawing and 33 people were given their chairs. Shortly thereafter, I was approached by one of the members Remember, I'm elected by the membership, therefore I better be responsive to them. And she explained that for physical reasons, of uh, due with hernias and things like that, hemorrhoids, whatever, she had to have one of these soft chairs. It was just a crucial necessity. She's approaching me, and I got a soft heart, but I got 15 or 20 other union members watching how I react to this. 
request, which she's making in public. And my response was, Genevieve, had you said a word before the lottery, I could have addressed it to the entire group, but you didn't. So you were part of the lottery. I didn't win a swivel chair. If I did, I would give you mine. But I didn't. Therefore, I'm sorry, you waited too long. You have to sit in a regular hard chair like the rest of us because there's no way on earth I can now, as your union delegate, go off and be unfair. Everyone would be mad at me for that. This is a minor little story, but that's what you have to remember. You have to always be perceived by everybody there, and you really should be, as being as fair as possible, fair as conceivable. We also had other things we did which were a lot more dramatic. I'll be giving you a copy of the uh, Mott Haven Crisis. It's a 40 page, 40 page, 40 page report on something that I did as a union delegate. Myself, a guy named Stanley Hill was president of SSCU, a large number of delegates and alternates, a whole bunch of administrative people, the Chamber of Commerce of 149th Street, the local police precinct, we all got together and did something. And it explains it very nicely. I didn't write it. It got written by somebody who was taking a graduate course and he wrote it for public affairs. He wrote the whole story and he wrote it pretty good. But what it comes down to is we were faced with the fact that the mayor had decided to close the welfare center, which was his right, only we found out it was for bad reasons. And it would make no sense and it would cause hurt to others. Well, wait a minute, that's not right. But if we're subordinate employees and we're only there to do what we're told, then we have no more to say because that's who we are. Except we weren't. In our own minds, we weren't. We were people with a certain amount of dignity. We had been raised properly. We acted properly. We did the right thing. If the man was going to do the wrong thing, maybe we would give him a hard time about it. Maybe that was why we were put on earth, to make sure that as much good and correctness was done as possible. How dangerous could it be? And did we really care very much? Because we were really quite annoyed with what was going on. And so kind of cleverly, we scared the hell out of him. We convinced him the South Bronx would go up in flames if he closed that center. It would not have gone up in flames. In fact, it would have just disappeared like that. But he didn't know that, and we arranged to make him believe it was going to happen the way we arranged it. it. Took a lot of work, but it also took an awful lot of cooperation between a lot of people. And this is the kind of thing that we used to do every so often, which is why they thought the Social Service Employees Union was very militant, because we would do things like that. I, you're going to read the whole paper, and you can ask me questions about it afterwards. I can talk about that one for hours, so I won't bother with that further right now. I will, however, at this point conclude because I'm running out of battery space and I figure I better stop at this point and at least clean up with the fact that I do have more of these war stories to tell. And the only question is, how patient will you be as I tell them? But thanks for listening this far anyway.